Hi everybody, welcome to my channel, Life Law Bin. Welcome back to my channel and today I have a very special guest. Um, I'm with my friend Kimar Roberts. He's an attorney at law and today we're going to discuss life at the bar in practicing in Barbados and then practicing in Antigua. So Kimar, the very first question I have for you, um, I think every law student will want to know this, how how was that transition for you um, from moving from law school, whether it's the LLB level, then on to Hewitton, you know, into real practice? How how was that transition for you? Um, <laughs> what was the it? Trans like? yeah. was, I don't want to say, I don't want to give the impression that it was easy. It was, I think, hard, difficult. Um, because practice is a little different still to what we do in law school, although that's considered the practical arm of the law program. Um, but it was fun, I think. Um, you have put so prepared, definitely prepare yourself mentally going into the job market um, when you're graduating law school. I think that's a part of the transition that people or lawyers don't really talk about. They would just jump in so when they got the job and then give you advice from there. But during that period, you have to remember that it's probably a highly competitive time because your entire class just graduated. You all want jobs. And just mentally prepare yourself for the volume of applications that you may have to make, some of the rejections that you may receive, not necessarily because of any lack of your qualities, but simply by sheer volume, this has been uh, my experience. Sometimes firms just don't have space. So you have to prepare yourself mentally for some of the rejections that you might potentially experience. Um, but when you do get a job, being optimistic, um, I believe that you now have to take the position that there's a dearth of knowledge that you now have to attain in terms of how things are practiced practically when you file documents who you have to go to when you have to have affidavits sworn who do you have to go to when you have to talk to the judge's clerk who is that person how does the court operate how do you ensure that your matters progress um how do you actually get your documents to opposing counsel there are many different practical aspects that you have to learn within the profession. And I definitely think that it is hard because it's not something you've ever necessarily been totally prepared for, but it is something that once you have a strong mentality and you're ready to embrace it, that you can have fun doing. There are times I had fun. <laughs> and once you are at a position now where you feel as though you're functioning how an attorney functions or the attorneys that you monitor how they function, then you're ready to go. No, I, I feel like many students um, who want to pursue law watch a lot of legal programs, like suits and how to get um, And, you know, they make a decision that law is the chosen path based on viewing these Americanized TV shows. Now, how close is that to the reality of actual practice? Um, I mean, it's highly dramatized. It's a show, it's for ratings. Um, so we can already knock that tier of how close it is to the reality off. Um, I do think that when you are knowledgeable of practice, there are certain things in the show you will notice and say, well, hey, we actually do that. So you will have moments where you're like, okay, this happens in reality. And then there are just other moments when they do certain things and you're just like, especially as a legally trained mind, you'll probably be like, okay, this is just TV. Um, so they're not necessarily 
representative of actual reality because it's a dramatized show. Um, yeah, so that'll be my answer. But I do like suits and I do used to like, you know, how to get away with murder. So. Yeah, but you know, I had to ask it because I, I feel like a lot of students, especially younger students, tend to watch these films and sometimes end up in this situation. Yeah, yeah. Based on it. Um, I mean, you will have more. You, sorry. Pardon? I didn't hear you. We had a few, we had a little glitch there, a technical glitch. You know, you know, I didn't hear you again. <laughs> Um, yeah, if, 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 yeah I, I don't understand what's happening. Okay, I think um, Kimar managed to, to fix that. Uh, so Kimar, low key, you're a little techie too. So, <laughs> anyway, um, you know, I think this is kind of the question that floats around the room. Many people pursue law because they think that, you know, they'd be able to be making a certain salary um, right. at a certain point in time. When do you think law students or law graduates should expect a certain salary, um, given, given that, you know, basically fresh out of school and you still have time to basically acclimatize to the job market? In answering this question, I don't think I will give a law student the advice that teachers probably usually give when they say, um, if you're looking to make money, this is not the profession, or that, you know, attorneys have to pay their pittance for the first couple of years of, of their life in practice. Um, and that's simply because I recognize that law students are bill paying individuals who have probably just taken out student loans are qualified and should be compensated for their worth. Um, now, having said that, I don't think that any law student should ever go out expecting to have an exorbitant salary. And I only say that because I think as an attorney, when you are qualified and skilled, as with any other profession or any other entrepreneur, you can charge your worth, right? And it's the same principle when you do ethics and you learn of how much you should charge as an attorney in your first one to two to three years when you realize there are certain things that you don't know yourself. You have to be reasonable with what you estimate your worth to be because there clearly has to be somewhere for you to charge as you elevate in your knowledge as you grow in your profession. And as a result of that, I say you should ensure that your worth is compensated, that you can cover the expenses that you've reasonably incurred now as a law student. Um, but don't go thinking you're going to be like Harvey Specter with your first paycheck. Yeah, fair enough. Um, bring the spot down to reality just a little bit. <laughs> yeah, but I think a lot of seniors usually like to see, you know, you gotta start the salt and then come up. Yeah, of course, of course. And I'm I'm so glad that I mean there's some people that will roughly just pop that bubble, but I feel like it's gently letting it <laughs> <laughs> you know. Um anyway, I know that you're qualified to practice in Barbados and you are qualified to practice in Antigua. Now, how was it for you when you were practicing in Barbados? And then um, how was it in terms of a comparison of experiences between practicing in Barbados and practicing in Antigua? Right. Um, <laughs> I said this more because when you asked me the question, I was thinking of all the different non-disclosure agreements I need to honor. <laughs> and just a joke, a legal joke. But, um, in Barbados, I was just fresh out of law school. Um, when I had opportunities, I saw them and I took them. And I'm thankful to the Honorable David Senator, Speaker of the House, sorry, um, Arthur Holder. That's where I started off with my journey. And I was able to do a lot of criminal 
litigation in magistrate's court, um, learn applications before the high court, just follow him around. And I also, my love was always company and corporate law. So I also kind of learned that along the way. And I have to give a lot of thanks to my friend, Anthony Francis Morrow. Um, he assisted me in learning like civil litigation. I followed him around court again. And I'm saying these things because I think that when you just come out of school, that's what you should do. You should put yourself in a position, even if you don't get a paycheck right away because you know, you're not billing or working at a firm or whatever the case is. Um, put yourself in positions from people that you admire or you see when you look at them, you think they do their jobs effectively. Put yourself in positions to learn from them. And in Barbados, that's what I did a lot of when I was practicing. I moved to Antigua because I got a job with a firm here, Richards & Company. Um, and obviously in a firm now, you kind of have a different perspective in terms of the types of clients that you have, where we do a lot of civil litigation, we represent banks, we do a lot of corporate um, litigation, we, a wide variety of stuff you become exposed to now. I still do some criminal litigation as well through the firm. Um, and I would say that the difference in practice here is that I just gained more knowledge because I was at a different stage in my profession now. Um, so I was able to take on learning a lot more, um, seeing myself realize that I'm understanding a lot more and things are coming more innately to me as I practice more. Um, so that's just the stage I'm in now. So that answers my duality of practice between Barbados and Antigua. No, you see, I think, I, I don't, I hope you don't underestimate this, but there are a lot of people that are scared or a little bit shy to leave Barbados to practice somewhere else. Now, I know you said you moved to Antigua because that's where you got work. Um, a lot of us, I think, tend to pigeonhole ourselves to one jurisdiction and, you know, not being able to be flexible enough or to adapt to move into a different situation in order to start earning income. Um, how did you, how, how would you encourage people to kind of develop that mindset to, you know, go for it? This is always my answer to everything for me. And I could only give what I have done as advice to these people, to these students. When you have a goal, literally plan the goal then you sit down and think of all of the steps you need to do to attain this goal. And from tomorrow, work on step one. That's it. Um, yes, everybody has different obstacles that they have to overcome. I have had my own. Um, but you have to believe in yourself and believe in where you want to be and where you need to go to get there. And I would also advise any law student in Barbados or any other territory or jurisdiction who may be thinking of seeking opportunities in other territories or jurisdictions to do so because we understand that the nature of our degree particularly um, when you go to law school within the region one of the three um, law schools you have the eligibility to be called to the a bar in majority of the jurisdictions, CARICOM jurisdictions. So I think that people should capitalize on those opportunities. I think that there's a lot of growth and experience waiting for people in environments where they have nothing to do but rely on their own grit because there's no family. The support system is back home. Um, you move to a new island. You need to prove yourself at your new job and you need to network in this new place with new people. And I think that it's a developmental benefit to anyone who's willing to consider. Yeah, definitely. And um, I, I have one last question for you. Uh, 
what what has it been like basically balancing your time between work and recreation because I think it's well known that attorneys have a lot of work and maybe carry home a lot of that work too. So how do you find time to basically turn off and distress? Hmm. I don't want to be a hypocrite. <laughs> I just came off of vacation and I felt like it was going to work. I think that, as I said before, that's the stage in my career that I'm at. I am handling a lot more complex matters, which I wanted to do, but it requires more of me than it would my seniors because I'm now exposing myself to newer material for the first time. Um, I think it's something that's required. I try my best with my loved ones to give them any time that I can and to keep it as balanced as possible. But I do think that younger attorneys do have to realize that we have to put in the time. Don't let your time be exploited. Um, and I would say that the nature of our profession and being in, in, in eras of globalization and, and now the digital age, you don't literally have to sit in an office till 10 to prove to someone that you're doing work until then, once you're able to produce the work at the end of the day. Um, so take home your work if you need to. Create healthy balances. Sometimes you might be doing more rudimentary stuff than necessarily mentally complex. You can do it and listen to some music or mm -hmm. ask someone close to you to maybe assist if it's not anything that's confidential. It is literally rudimentary. Um, those are just options that you can exercise to try to create the balance that people talk about. Um, but I will honestly say, even my seniors too, I do see them work hard. So I think people need to understand that this is a profession that you have to work hard in if you are a good attorney. Some people can be lackadaisical and as a result, the client suffers, but you have to undertake the obligation to work hard because you're taking on people's, you're literally someone's legal representative and it means something. And people are paying you to give a service to them. And you have an obligation to make sure that you do it to the best of your ability. I think that's well said. I, I definitely think that's well said. Um, do you have any tips, any tips for students who are currently in law school? Um, do you have any tips for them in terms of getting their CV ready for the world of work? I think um, in getting your CV ready, you really need to be focused. It's not, especially coming into this profession, it's not a situation where you have to put down every little thing in the professional world, the world that you did. Mm -hmm. The same thing maintains. When you have a goal, state the goal, and set the plans you need to do to achieve it. So there are certain things about your qualities you have to first sit down and think about your best qualities, obviously, the qualities that you want to sell. When you've identified those, you think of the things that you have done that will evidence those qualities. Those are the things that you need to put on your CV. In this profession, there's a lot of reading and I've experienced it, so I know what I'm telling you. Some people will not respond to your applications because they just don't have the time. So if they do have the time to watch your application, it needs to be attractive from the initial read. So cut out all of the, the other things that you think are good because it says that you did stuff and get to the things that will tell the interviewer or the potential boss why they should hire you based on the vision statement on their websites or, or the firm, the mission statement, what service they say they provide, how their team is oriented. So it includes, again, doing research, looking at the goals, making sure this place that you're applying to is a place that you will complement, and then making sure that you tailor a CV to that place for what they're looking for.
that's what I would recommend. And I do think that there will be instances that you will have to tailor your CV per application. I know some people just like to have a CV and say, that's my CV or, or I leave it. But if you want to show that you are the top applicant for the position, sometimes you may want to tweak one or two things that will be in congruence with certain little things of, of whatever firm you're applying to. That was definitely a mouthful, but very good um, advice. No, 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 no. That's. I think. I feel like everybody that's watching this 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 video um, would be extremely grateful for this information because generally, I feel like lack of information is one of the reasons why people don't do well or get off to a very hard start. You know. So thanks. I have one more piece of advice, if I may. And you just made an important point and I just wanted to stress it. Lack of knowledge is the only concept that literally can keep an attorney from being a good one. Whether it is knowledge of an ethical or professional obligation you have to someone, a client, or knowledge of the law. Those really are the only two things keeping you back. And the way to practice that from now is for law students to be sharing knowledge amongst themselves because you're coming into a profession where you will have to create a brotherhood, a sisterhood kind of fraternity amongst yourselves in order to propel your cases forward. Not saying that you ignore or go against your client's best interest in working with your fellow attorney, but because you represent somebody's interest does not mean that you have to be nasty or curt or this to your fellow attorney. And in practice, you will have to rely on each other. There may be a case that an attorney won the week ago, they use certain principles that you're, you want to rely on now. You will, may have to ask that attorney for any points or tips into the research that they did or even just ask them for the cases that they use. And it starts when you're in law school and sharing information. Because you share information, you don't, lose any you know you don't become better than anyone else or that person doesn't get put in a higher step than you because you've shared information with them what you're doing is fostering a brotherhood where you all can at least rely on each other's reputations when you're in practice you, you see i think that's that's very vital because i know that sometimes um I can only speak about my experience in law school. Law students, a lot of law students are very selfish with information. They don't, they don't like to share information. And maybe it is um, as we, I guess, progress through, through this system of teaching and then progress eventually into the world of work, then I think you will understand the benefit of sharing. But at this stage, um, it's, it's very unfortunate really um, that we tend to try to hoard information um, because you think you'll be better than the other person. You think you're going to get a better grade than the person. You don't want them to get a better grade than you. Yeah, simple. But I'm glad that, you know, there's some emphasis here on sharing knowledge um, because, you know, we need to actually foster that kind of, that kind of brotherhood and sisterhood. Um, eventually. So I'm, I'm actually grateful for that, um, that last point that you decided to add. And I think if that's everything, I just want to say thank you for finding the time in your busy schedule. Lighten me. <laughs> You're welcome. Mm -hmm. In your busy schedule to come and have a chat with us because I feel like there is always, you know, a, a much needed space for this kind of dialogue. Students, students always need information, um, especially you know, entering the profession. And I mean, facts and just, just not generic stuff that you may find online, you know. So I just want to say thank you for, for coming and sharing that information. Um, and if that's everything, then that's a wrap. And I will definitely see everybody, including you, Kimar, on the next video. See you guys later.